so basically what Gupta wants to talk about and, and cover in this project work is is try and get over some of the some of the mechanisms behind what might be happening with some of the practices that are put in place through regenerative approaches to agriculture and how they may play out in our drier systems. So ultimately we hear a lot about diversity and diversity in what's above ground does interplay with diversity below ground. Soil biota and the, di the diversity, diversity within the soil, soil below the surface is huge. There are somewhere between uh, 100 million and a billion microbes per gram or per teaspoon of soil. The interesting thing is not though how many different thing, different individual species are there, but more interestingly, the different roles that they have to play and how redundant some of those roles are across the microbial community. So how, by redundant, I mean how likely it is that that process is going to carry on happening if a, one species dies out. Oh, there we are. That wasn't too far off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so ultimately, we're, we're interested in the functional diversity rather than the actual species diversity in this soil. Rather, one way I've, I've tried to distill this down in the past is I, I don't really care whether Tom, Dick and Harry are there. What I do care is whether or not the soil is going to function if Tom happens to die, whether or not Dick and Harry can carry on with that process. Multiply it up from three to, to a billion different, um, different genes present in the soil and you'll get an idea of the complexity that lies there. Uh, and ultimately, one of the principles here is, is where can we have a, a, a more light touch approach to how we manage soil biology. Typically in the past we've, we've generally tried to, tried to almost work against it in some regards. Other ways in which we can build practices that, that work alongside it and, and better harness its, its abilities. So soils are very diverse. Um, they're doing an awful lot of different things and that diversity extends from, from the micro, micro diversity, so, so inver soil invertebrates, right the way down to bacteria and, and for that matter, viruses. We've all seen how impactful one virus can be in the, uh, in the past 18 months. Um, viruses have a role to play in soils as well and interact with the soil community. So there's so basically that range from effectively not much more than a few strands of DNA knocked together in a protein that we all know and definitely do not love, um, all the way up to, to larger insects that you can actually see in the soil surface. And, and biology covers that whole range, that whole range of life. Now the interest, the the real principles that Gupta's tried to put behind this is this, is this um, looking at how those processes contribute to soil health and soil function and what he terms functional microbial ecology, which is that, again, that real focus on, on what are the processes we actually need to get out of this system, what is it that we're trying to work with and what is it that we're trying to stop. So processes we're trying to work with, obviously turnover of nutrients and release of nutrients back to, back to plants to be able to, to grow crops. What we're also really interested in is, is building carbon, as I spoke to earlier and so did Amanda earlier um, in the afternoon. And also another thing that, that is definitely getting more towards outside of my sphere, but into disease management. And if you have a, an active and resilient microbial community, you're in a much less risky situation from being colonized by soils being colonized by pathogens. So there's a few reasons why you're wanting to build microbial resilience in your system. So what this project's tried to look over has been taking, the, taking a view that regen, regenerative agriculture practices are a gradient. It's, this isn't like um, a very prescriptive system like organic agriculture that, that says very clearly what you can and cannot do to be classed as organic. And the idea is that if you do those things, there will be this outcome. Regenerative agriculture is more focusing on the ends rather than the means. It's looking at where you want to get to and then what practices might be more or less appropriate to, to try and achieve that aim. So it doesn't outright, yeah, there, there are definite practices that are discouraged. Um, and again, the difference between organic certification and being a regenerative practice is, is you know, it's not a protected term, it's not a legal definition. There are, 
there are many shades of grey here, and, and if people did see my talk at GRDC a couple of weeks ago, I had two slides that compared current best practice dryland agriculture in Australia and a lot of the main aims of regenerative agriculture, and, and the two are not too far removed from each other. Which, which, going back to a bit of the conversation at the end of Eliza's talk just there, again, <laughs> leaves the other interesting point that you've not just got the issue of water. The fact is that Australian growers, knowing how adverse the systems are that they're working in, have been doing a lot, an awful lot already. Um, yeah, one of the biggest things, certainly in, in European and American conversation about regenerative agriculture is, is reducing the amount of tillage. Well, how long have we all been doing no-till agriculture? Longer than I've been in this country, that's for certain, um, in the most part. So, so there are a lot of different practices um, that are regen-ish, for want of a better term. And the purpose of this project um, that Gupta's involved with and that I'm presenting on today is to, is to sample key microbial indicators across a lot of properties that have got different characteristics of regenerative agricultural practice. Um, and these go towards um, things like crop diversity, um, fertilizer use, pesticide use, tillage, whether or not you're doing cover crops or encouraging growing cover during the dry season, um, stubble retention, grazing, and, and what was done was, was these Scores were given at the properties for each, on each of these scales. So if we take tillage, zero for full zero till, whereas two would be, as Gupta's termed it here, old school. So two or more passes with a plough uh, within a season. Fertilizers and manures, so no synthetic chemical inputs versus high levels of chemical inputs during cropping. So there's a few different, so those, those, those are the scales by which he's tried to get this huge gamut of different, different practices and trying to get them on a comparable footing. So if we look at why, how, why we might want to do some of these things, tillage, apart from when it's done strategically um, to overcome specific constraints, tillage, routine tillage, basically we know, it affects all structure. It does alter nitrogen mineralization through aiding decomposition of organic material, but of course you're aiding that decomposition of organic material probably at a rate quicker than you're building it. Subble management, it's a critical source of carbon for soil microbes. So if you're heavily grazing it or harvesting it and, and on selling it or taking it somewhere else, that's going to have an impact. Um, Crop diversity, and that's not necessarily, as I discussed in my own talk, diversity within a rotation, but rotation, diversity across rotations. So building in legumes, not going wheat, 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 canola, wheat, wheat, wheat. Basically looking at building resilience across the system. Fertilizers, I touched on this in my own talk, they're a bit of a double-edged sword in the context of trying to balance microbial activity and indeed yield and build carbon. Um, clearly you're not going to grow very much without them, but at the same time, are there better ways to use them? So this is some of the data that Gupta's got here for me to present for him, and these are the 30 or so paddocks across the South Australian Victoria regions that the project covers. Um, up here, we've got microbial biomass carbon, so that's the size of the microbial community. Um, the axes, are, if I can't see it from here, you definitely can't. Uh, Ranging in milligrams per gram, sorry, micrograms per gram, so milligrams per kilogram, from around about 200 for the lowest, up to around 1,000 milligrams per gram, so 1%. End mineralization potential, which is this figure, ranging from, I think, 4 is about the lowest, through to around about 20 milligrams per gram, presumably per hour. That must have a rate of soil. Sorry, this is the trouble with doing second-hand presentations. You don't completely get across the details till you stood in front of an audience. Um, but ultimately what these figures show is that there's huge variability across, across these 30 different paddocks that were surveyed here. And that variability is as, is as great within regions as it is between regions. And with the error bars on some of these, they're quite large. So this variability within paddocks is also really large, just the same as the problem with carbon. Soil is highly variable. So what Gupta's asked me to do with this presentation is focusing on, on three different paddocks um, that are of interest here. Um, and you see them highlighted. 
the 7779, 8688 and 8991, which, yes, used to me too. Basically, they're, they're, they're paddocks and different properties. They have different, man different management has been imposed on them. And working through this next slide, we can go through just how regenerative they might be. So, all, first thing, all three are no-till. That's not too surprising. Um, I wish you luck if you want to do one of these studies, trying to find one of the few people who still tills three or four times a year. Um, which is an interesting aside when it comes to the continuum of practice of regen versus conventional. Australia is already well over, probably past the center towards regen, common, pra common best practice agriculture already is. So it's a bit of a false equivalence to pit regen versus conventional in Australia in the same way it might be in parts of Europe or America. Because you're already on a, on a gradient of conventional to regen. Most of Australia is already here. So that's worth bearing in mind. Um, not just are the gains harder to get because of the moisture in the first instance. The gains are harder to get because they've already been doing it far better than a lot of the rest of the world for a long period of time. So back to these three paddocks. Um, the top one, 7779. The main difference there is that while stubble was retained, it was also heavily grazed. Whereas the other two paddocks, full stubble, were either grazed slightly or not grazed at all. 8991, however, was continuous cropping as opposed to pasture crop systems. So there are some differences between them, and this is on, on the scale, and again, this is preliminary data, first of all. Secondly, it's not my data, and thirdly, the screen is almost impossible to read for me, <laughs> me here. The, across the top are various different properties that, that Gupta has investigated, ranging from microbial carbon, the data that we showed, carbon and nitrogen mineralization, the way through to various enzyme activities and active or available carbon. Now, in the system that has, that has got rotational grazing um, and a high pasture part of its rotate of the whole rotation system, actually has the lowest measurements for most of these variables that we're interested in. It's the most regen-like, has the lowest so lowest soil quality, soil health. Now, why is that? The principal message here is this grazing. Really heavy grazing, even over a short period of time. If you're, if you're taking off all this biomass that you're creating in stubble, there's less carbon going in, there's less carbon to feed the microbes, the microbes are less active. That's not to say don't graze, but you need to understand that if you are doing, you can't take for granted that your stubble retention is going to be doing the same as somebody who isn't grazing. So Mark is the person that took those samples. The paddock that was grazed is bare with like a lot of bare earth at the moment yep uh, whereas the the 991 or whatever it is i can't read from here yeah, awesome. um full soil cover um with the last year's crop the year before and the year before stubble complete ground cover yep so that's that's one really useful information to me and really useful information to the room so even though this paddock, this top paddock, 7779, would probably, be, probably come up as appearing more regen on, in terms of practices being imposed in actuality because of how they're being carried out. These two, probably more towards the conventional end, at least in the Australian level of conventional, are actually inputting more carbon to the system and resulting in better microbial function across a whole range of different metrics. Well, and one of those, re one of those conventional per se one yes. is out past Brown's well, so and really, really low rainfall for the last four years. Right. So <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so the devil is very much in the detail with this. And an another reason why why again it really shouldn't be seen as regen versus conventional. You have a huge continuum. And I'd actually add libbing a little bit here. Um, the SCART project, the National Soil Carbon Project that Jeff Baldock ran ten years ago. Good conventional practice um, actually ended up with higher carbon in places than really, really poorly executed um, no-till 
management systems. Back then, there was still a bit, still more comparisons to be made there. So even even things like that, there is a there is a crossover with most of these things, and that's and that's the fundamental difference with reach end versus either bi biodynamic or organic is that you do have this gradient to play with, as opposed to just prescribing and proscribing activities in organic systems that, that might actually be taking you backwards because you're not be able to apply the nutrients that you're exporting, for example. So, where are we going to from here? Um, one of the things that, that Gupta's found across these data more generally is that, is that rotation diversity is actually quite important. I suspect from a, from a farm risk mitigation perspective, it's also quite important because you have years where, where one crop, where the climate doesn't suit one crop quite so well as it does another. So it's a way of spreading your risk as well. There are other reasons to do this, but it does appear to be one of the main drivers of, of building resilience in, the, in soil function itself. Particularly if you're, bringing in, if you're bringing in legumes, as we discussed in my own talk, and others have talked about, yeah, you, not only do they grow differently, but of course they fix nitrogen, some of which will remain in the system. And even, in, and even if much doesn't, because you're harvesting most of the grain, that's one year you're not applying chemical fertilizer. So the regen practices that, that, we've really, look, that really appear to be driving this, um, it really, really comes down to stubble management and grazing. So yes, retaining stubble, great, but if, you, if you're then heavily grazing it or exporting it, a lot of that carbon that needs to go into the soil is being taken off and taken somewhere else. That's not to say that grazing is always bad, and clearly you need to weigh that up with the farm business system more generally. Um, but you do need to bear in mind that, that if you're taking off those two or three tons of carbon that are there as stubble, and, to, and turning it into sheep, well, that's not going to go into the soil and feed the microbes. Maybe that works for the business system, and, and I'm not going to comment on that, but nonetheless, it is having an impact on the soil in a way that might not be able to be offset by other practices that you're undertaking on the regen spectrum. Plant and crop diversity, um, again, there are many reasons for this. Disease is obviously the greatest one. You're going wheat, 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 wheat. You are really opening yourself up to problems, no matter how profitable it might appear in the first couple of years. But plant rotational, but rotational diversity does appear to have an impact on soil resilience of soil function, and it's definitely something that should be looked at more. And with that, I'll thank you for um, putting up with a very poor second grade attempt at being up to. Um, <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.